Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments, where tonight we're going to take a look at something old and something new with the TI-84 Plus CE graphing calculator. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough-to-teach, tough-to-learn concepts accessible to all my students. Tonight, I'm excited to be joined by our two panelists, Kathy Hale and Johnny Ashurst. Kathy has Hello, been a TQ. Hi, Kathy. Hey, so Kathy has been a TQ regional instructor for many years, and after working in Texas middle and high schools, currently works at a regional educational service center. She provides professional development opportunities and technical support for teachers in 13 Texas counties. Much of her work has been in developing materials and strategies to help students utilize graphing technology to improve their performance on state assessments. Kathy, thanks so much for being with us. Certainly. And Johnny has served as a school district mathematics consultant and as a high school mathematics instructor. He's also served as a MODSPAR instructor with the Advanced Teacher Capacity Initiative at Ohio University. Johnny, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Well, have fun, I hope. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send any questions to Johnny or Kathy using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. And we'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the event along with a link for all the documents that are being used tonight. We hope you don't have any audio issues, but in the event that you do, try selecting Communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose Audio Broadcast. Also, if you had read the description for the webinar, it was mentioning that if you have your 84, you could bring it along with you and, uh, and try to learn some stuff tonight. Uh, and that's a great idea, especially if you're a more experienced 84 user. Um, if you feel like you might not be, uh, then maybe the best way to experience tonight is just to kind of sit back and relax and take everything in. Again, this is being recorded, and you're automatically going to get a link uh, in your email to the recording in a couple of days. And that's great because then you can go at your own pace. You can stop, pause, or rewind, and, uh, and grab your 84 then as well. So if you don't have it tonight, don't worry about it. If you do have it and you feel comfortable in grabbing it and trying some stuff out, that's great. But if you feel like maybe uh, things are moving a little bit too fast or, or you're getting a little frustrated, uh, then maybe hang back and just wait for the recording to start using your 84. At this point, Kathy is going to discuss our agenda. Well, we'd like to tell you that we really appreciate your uh, joining us this evening. We hope that the comments and and conversations we have will help you get ready for your school year that you're about to begin. We're going to be working specifically with the TI-84CE and looking at some ways that we might be able to simplify students' work while we enhance their conceptual understanding. And we're going to showcase some of the features, both old and new, of the TI-84. Then there'll be a closing at the end. Please be sure and hang around for the end because there's a drawing at the end that Michael will take care of. There's a gift for someone at the end of the evening. Kathy, thanks so much. Johnny is going to discuss our expected outcomes. This evening, uh, Kathy will begin with uh, the ask feature and the uh, some strategies on using the store capacity. Uh, after that, I will talk about the sequence mode, uh, some features with sequence and piecewise graphing. And again, some of this will be about the technology and some will be about good mathematics. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny. And Kathy, I'm giving you control. Feel free to share your screen. Looks good. Okay, um, what we're going to be talking about in the first few minutes of our conversation today are honestly some things that I wish I had known to teach my students from the very beginning days of using graphing calculators. Um, 
there's many, many ways to work problems with these machines, but over time, one of the things that I've learned to focus on is how can we simplify kids' mechanical thinking so that they can focus on their mathematical thinking. And, and a couple of the strategies may be new to some of you, may be old hat to some of you as we go through a couple of sample questions to give you an idea of how we can simplify what some of the students may do. Again, like Michael said, please be sure if you have your handheld with you that you um, uh, pick those up and uh, punch buttons along or you can just sit back and watch. Um, one of the things that I've learned to do that many, many students really like a lot is to try to figure out um, how to make the machine as efficient as possible. And I want to talk to you first about um, using the patterns that we get in equation settings and how to find the answers with the least amount of physical and mental stress for the students as we can possibly. On the right hand side of your, my screen, you see that we have a typical kind of question that we might see. The area of a rectangle is given by the equation that's given in which x is the length and the question is uh, what is the width of the rectangle or what is the length of the rectangle. And most of the students always know that you use the equa equation editor key or the y equals button as most of them call it to put in the um, expression that's given, 2x squared subtract 5x. And the question really is here, they have to understand mathematically, I want to know what the input value is for which 18 would be the output value. And when we're looking at this, this is an example of um, a place where we just need to know which one of those answers is, is correct. This is a previous really uh, question on one of our state assessments. So if we're looking at this, graphs are very difficult to find specific answers sometimes. Uh, we found that using the table, I'm going to go second table above the graph key, is a much clearer way for students to find the answer. But if you'll notice here, I'm looking for an output value of 18 and I don't see it and there's an awful lot of numbers on the screen. So when the students are looking at this, uh, they're going to have to go hunting for that and your brain would have to filter out all the numbers you aren't looking at to find the one that you have. And so that's, that's especially for some of the special ed students with which I've worked, that's a very difficult process for them to do. So one of the things that I, I wish I had used earlier in my teaching career is to change the way the table is set up. So I'm going to hit the second key and go to table set which is above window. The default when our students get the machines and they're brand new is the table starts at zero, it increments by one, and it automatically puts all of those input or x values in, and it automatically uses the pattern in the equation editor to dump out all of those numbers that we had um, on our, our screen in our table. But that's a lot of information to process. And just FYI, if I set the, um, if I arrow down to the independent value and right arrow so that the box is blinking on the word ask and then hit enter, it changes the way that the machine does the work. It's going to ask me which independent value I want to check and it would then automatically uh, pop out the dependent value. Let me show you what that looks like. Again, I'm going to go to second table. And you can see now that it's empty. I haven't changed the pattern I'm using, 2x squared subtract 5x. But I want to know if I put 1 and a half in as my independent or my x value, does 18 come out? If I put 2 in, does 18 come out? If I put 4 and a half in, does 18 come out? So there's the answer to the question. And as you'd notice, um, that's one of the places where the increment of the table in its natural state, uh, incrementing by one, is not necessarily going to land on the x value that's going to give them the answer to the question. So you can see as you look at this particular screen that your eye doesn't have to process very many pieces of information. I see two that don't work, one that does, and I'd be ready then to move on to the next part of the work. Here's another example of the way questions where the ask capacity of the table is a very helpful, very clean, very um, low energy process for the student while still understanding the mathematics involved. 
A function is described by the equation that's given. The replacement step for the independent variable is uh, given. Which of the following is contained in the corresponding set of dependent variables? For a lot of our students, this is a very verbally dense question. But one of the things that we can do is build their confidence that they understand what happens in this problem. I have four numbers that are supposed to go in to the, to the pattern, the function rule that's given, and I need to find which one of those numbers comes out. So it, it becomes an almost automatic process for the students. I go to my equation editor, I clear out what's there. One of the things when I'm working with students, especially in an assessment setting, is to remind them that their first major responsibility is to check that what they type on the calculator is the same as what's in the problem. And it's easy to see that all the symbols work here. The one thing that the students have to get used to if they're using the table capacity in ASK is that I see the leftover numbers from last time. You'll notice that every time you exit a table and then go back into the table, um, it will always start with the first um, independent value, the first x value that's there. That's where the black cursor is. So if we just delete until all of those are gone, it's like we have a clean piece of paper. So again, here's the question that the student has to understand. If I input a zero into this function rule, do I get one of those numbers out down there? The answer is no. If I try the next one, it gives me 30. That is not there, or 38. If I input a seven, 54 comes out. If I input 15, excuse me, uh, if I'd get on the right list, this would be a little bit more helpful. If I input 12, you know, it'd be helpful if I could see my screen here really well. Um, I seem to have some numbers that are not the right one. So let me start again. If I'll delete all of these. I'll speak more clearly. The question is, if one is in the um, set of independent values, six is the correct output value, and it's already there. So for this particular problem, the students really only have to check one of the input values. If we were giving them this as a regular pencil paper assignment, we'd expect them to input all four of those values and give all four of the outputs. But sometimes that much work isn't necessary. If the students were doing this uh, completely in a non-multiple choice setting, it would still give them the four output values very easily and without, uh, it eliminates the places where they could have uh, their arithmetic errors that, you know, most of our kids know their algebra pretty well, but sometimes the arithmetic gets in the way of their processing. Here's another sample question where this is, is pretty straightforward for a lot of students. Um, function notation can sometimes be very confusing for students, especially when they're getting used to this. And, and this is a typical kind of problem that I might see in a textbook. Um, if p of x is 5 times x squared plus 1 plus 16, what's the value of p of 11? And so this is one of the ways also where you can use this capacity. Um, with the table, but there's another way to do this as well that I wanted to, to share with you that, again, some students really like using the table set on ask for the independent value, and others like to use the home screen. And this is a typical place where another strategy can, can be used. Either strategy works well if you only have to find P of 11. On the home screen, one of the other tools that you can use is the store key which is uh, just to the left of the digit one on your handheld. So if I ask the calculator to take our input value 11 and store that for my variable x, you'll notice that's on the left-hand side of the screen. When I hit the enter key, the number 11 jumps to the right-hand side of the screen, which indicates that the handheld has saved that value for x. And that will stay in place until another value for x is given in another circumstance. You then input the pattern below that, 5 times x squared plus 1 plus 16. So we get the value for p of 11. But what happens if you need to have multiple values that are there? 
one of the things about utilizing the um, values that are given for you here is that if you're using the home screen, like I said, a lot of students really like this. It's very visually clean. You don't see things that are not um, involved with this problem. You don't really have to, to do as much cleanup maintenance work. If I wanted to find the value of P of negative 3, I would ask the machine to take negative 3 and again use the store key to the left of the digit 1 for the variable in the problem. And here's the only thing that you have to remind the students about it, but they think this is a really cool thing to do. I always tell, help, tell kids that these machines are really smart, but they can't read. We have a value here, and the pattern into which it is to be um, utilized has to be below the value. You'll notice I used my up arrow keys to get to the pattern that I wanted, and when I hit the, hit the enter key, it copies and pastes it down below. So to get the right syntax or the right conversation with the machine so it'll perform the task that we're asking for, the value negative 3 is x has to be above the pattern. There are a lot of kids that think that is the coolest thing because now they understand that this really is a handheld computer because I need to copy and paste. If I had the 18 that I wanted to store for the value x, again, I would have to up arrow to get on the function rule and paste that down below so the machine understands the question that's being asked. Take the value 18 for x, substitute that in for x everywhere it is in the pattern, and the enter key will give you the value that you would need. So those are two particular strategies that are very clean for the students to have uh, at their disposal. And honestly, when I really started looking at how to do the storing work on the calculator, it was when students were really having trouble with equations that were given in standard form. That's very difficult for a lot of the students with which I've worked because they, they have limited arithmetic skills. Their algebraic thinking was uh, much better than their ability to do multiple steps with signed numbers and always get the right answers by hand. So, I would like to look at this one with you for just a moment. And I'm going to hit my clear key on my handheld so that I get rid of all that distracting information from the previous problem. And this is a very typical uh, problem that our students encounter in lots of places. What's the equation in standard form of the line that passes through the point 124 and has a slope of negative 6 tenths? Again, this is, is, is a very typical question that many students miss a, on standardized tests or, or classroom tests that may be multiple choice. And if a student really understands the work that the numbers do in the problem, they don't have to use uh, the point slope formula of a line, which is not always an easy thing for many of the students to, to follow through the points here. If they understand, I have an equation, my jo job at first is to see if 124 is on one of those equations. So this is in two variables. I wanted to make sure that you understood what that would look like. In the ordered pair that were given in the problem, I would store one for my x value. And again, when it moves to the left-hand side, I've now changed um, the value of x that is saved in its memory system to a 1. And I need to take the number 24 and store it for a y. We do not have a designated key for y on this uh, machine, but if you'll look above the digit 1 in green, you'll see that that's where the letter Y is. So you have to hit the alpha key first. Then you can use whatever variables the student has in the problem. So I have my ordered pair saved. Now all I have to do is type the expression that I'm using. If you'll notice in this particular problem, all of the expressions to begin with are the same, 3x plus 5, and I have to hit the alpha key to get the y above the digit 1. So what the machine's going to do now is plug in x1 for the x value, 24 for the y value, and it never misses the arithmetic. I often tell students, this is a machine. If you ask it the wrong question, it will give you the wrong answer. But if you ask it the correct question, you'll always get the right answer because it never misses its arithmetic. 
So if you'll notice the answer choices that we have here, only one of the equations has 3x plus 5y equal to 123. So again, you can have as many variables as you need. The values for the variables have to be above the pattern or the expression that you're utilizing. One of the things that I wanted to make sure that you, you think about is that both of these particular tools are great ways for kids to check their regular classroom work. We, we know that we want them to learn how to do the processes by hand. We all expect them to show that work. But one of the hardest things to get kids to do is to check their work. And so here's a, a typical question that students might do at a variety of grade levels. And when they're looking at this, um, they might get the answer negative 6 for this equation. And I wanted to show you about three different ways that they could check this. Again, I'm going to hit my clear key. And I could take that negative 6 and store that for the variable x. And here, if a student understands what it means for two quantities to be equal, there's two different things that I can do here on the home screen. I could take the, the expression 3x plus 5, and I can get that value. And I could put in x subtract 7, and I could put in that uh, the x in that one. And they should turn out to be the same, because that's what it means for the two sides of an equation to be equal. One of the other things that you can do, if you choose, that is an option is to simply type the expression as a whole. 3x plus 5 equals, and to get the equals button, if you look above the math key, you'll see the word test, and it's blue. So if I second test, that's where the equal sign and some other symbols that you'll see before uh, John gets through with his work today. I want to know if it's true or not, if this is an equation when x is negative 6, if it gives you a true answer. If it is correct, this uses Boolean algebra. Most of us maybe haven't thought about that in a very long time. If the answer that I'm checking as a student does make this statement true, it gives you a 1. If the statement is false, it gives you a 0. I don't want the kids to particularly remember that word, Boolean. I want them to know if I'm grading their work, they get one point if the answer is correct. They don't get a point. They get zero if their answer is incorrect. So here's two different ways that you could check this. And again, thinking kids will pick the method that makes a sense to them. Your brightest and best kid in the room will uh, vary theirs just for their own self-entertainment oftentimes. If we're here, most of the students would probably pick 6x plus 5 in y sub 1, and x subtract 7 in y sub 2, and they would go to a table and check to see if my x value is negative 6, do I get the same thing out? All three of those strategies gave you the same way to check your answers, and wouldn't it be wonderful if all of our students would check their answers every day when they're doing work like this? So again, I wanted to just remind you of or introduce you to the table under table set, set on ask, and I, I will add one other comment here. People always ask me, well, why don't you set the table on the dependent value on ask? That doesn't change anything except you have to have one other keystroke in order to get the answer. So my students have always found that this is the way that's the most efficient, where the machine is asking me for the specific x values in a particular problem and it automatically then gives me the values that are generated by whatever pattern I have in my equation editor. So all of these, the, the table on ask and um, looking at uh, the home screen as a means to store are two ways that students seem to find very efficient. And like I mentioned briefly, special ed students of, of my experience had a tendency to really latch on to the storing because it looks to them to be the least visually complicated. They still have to all understand what it means to be equal. They still have to understand what it is to have a value uh, to check in an equation. Their math knowledge is not different. The machine just simplifies the arithmetic. Um, 
as we're transitioning to our next uh, presenter, what I'd ask you to do is to think about other kinds of problems where you could either set, use your tables given on ask or use the storage capacity. I would ask you to consider, especially when you're working with finding solutions for systems of equations where they're in two variables, the storing on the home screen seems to be a really helpful thing for kids to do. Um, it just makes their, their checking of their answers so much simpler. Thank you very much for your attention. And I am going to um, stop sharing my screen and try to get back to the part of the screen where I can give it to Mr. Ashurst. Michael, I have part of my screen missing, so give me just a second. No problem, Kathy. It's just not there. Okay, um, I'll take care of it. Would you please? No problem. Thank you. Johnny, uh, just so you know you're muted and uh, you currently have control, feel free, to, feel free to share your screen and unmute. Thank you, everybody. Hey, Johnny, you're muted. I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Hello, everyone. I have a small request, and I'll ask that request in just a moment. And my, my screen is up. Is that right? Yep, it looks good. Okay. Uh, before I start, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to pose a question, and I will. Uh, I got this question from the chat. One of the questions that I did see there is, if I store a value for x, then what do I do uh, with that later? You can store a new value, as Kathy did, and you can use the memory settings. Uh, I was going to type this in the chat. But you can move into memory to uh, clear those. If those are things that, uh, if we have time, we'll come back to that. Uh, otherwise, if you have those specific questions, um, perhaps we can answer those uh, at the end. Okay. So I have a question for you, and I'll ask you to um, use the chat, and I'll ask Mike or Kathy to um, reveal the response. If you've used the expression next now, would you enter a one in the chat? Just a one. Mike or Kathy? We're getting uh, we're getting some ones. I have it looks like five total ones, maybe six. So that looks like that is not a large population of our uh, uh, attendees today. And the reason that, uh, and I've selected the next now uh, in reference to the sequence, it is, uh, I've taken that from a textbook. Uh, for authors, the uh, lead author, Greg Foley, the uh, textbook is Advanced Quantitative Reasoning. The idea here is that students can be challenged sometimes by uh, U sub n, or, or a sub n, uh, a sub zero, a sub one, uh, things such as uh, U of n minus one. But next and now, well, that's something that uh, lower level students can do, as an example. And I'd mentioned earlier, uh, and even in the um, uh, advanced promotion, that you have your own device. Well, sometimes the best device to have is pencil paper, make your own notes. That way you can pick up your uh, handheld later and give that a try. So I'm going to uh, do the following. I'm entering a nine on the home screen. Any value is fine. With that, 
if we were to choose to type plus 3, we now have a 9. What's next? And of course, the students know. And if we touch Enter, we now have a 12. What's next? And recursive thinking does not have to be great in depth. One of the things that I see here is that students in primary grades are accustomed to recursive thinking. Somewhere in middle grades, we begin to think in a different way. And Kathy does a wonderful job. If you ever see it, have an opportunity to be at one of her presentations where she talks about that those linking strategies from primary to middle grades on moving from recursive or, or connecting recursive thinking and the thinking for explicit functions. Okay. So right here we have a sequence situation. Well, I'm going to try one more. And I'll start with a new value. Maybe that value can be, uh, we'll start with an 8. And with 8, if I were to choose open parenthesis, second, and the negative sign at the bottom of the device, and you see the phrase answer is written above that, perhaps times 2 plus 6, and close the parenthesis. The device will close the parenthesis. That's good technology. But good mathematics says that if I create the open, I close it. And touching the enter key. So this sequencing process of what do I have now and what will I have next. Touching the enter key again, and we repeat the process continually. So there's some thinking about sequences uh, on, this pay, on, the, uh, on this home screen, but I would suggest this. If we change the answer multiplied by 2 plus 6, is it possible that we could do something there so that we guided the students toward the same number every time? And we would never get to that number but through this process, we could unfold the concept at very early grades of limits. All right, we won't take the time to provide an example such as that. But uh, let's see here. I think I have. Here's an example. If I started with a 4 and then I chose the answer plus 50 and divided by 2, we see the result is 27. Uh, recursive thinking, and you can see that the answers that I'm coming up with will be closer and closer and closer to 50. In fact, the longer, the more we do this, we can take this simple grade school game and start talking about approaching or limits. Okay. And notice on the screen that I have a new page but there are set symbols used. And the difference here, we'll move back and let's give this a try. So I'm going to insert, and I think as Kathy had done, I'll clear the home screen. Second open parenthesis opens the set symbol. And I'm going to insert a zero, and there's a comma key above seven. And it's uh, in celebration of those people who uh, come from language arts. So we'll insert a comma and perhaps the number 2. Good Mathematics closes the set and enter. Instead of going through the process we had before, it's going to be very similar, but we need to stay within set symbols. Second, open print to start a set, and I'd like to, do, I'd like to do something with that first value, so that's going to be second answer, open parenthesis, one, close. So I'm going to do something with my first answer, and I'd like to add one with it, comma.
second, answer, open parenthesis, two, close parenthesis, multiply by two as an example only. Don't forget the good mathematics, close the set. Now when we touch the enter key, we will be adding one to the first value and multiplying by two with the second value. So my strategy and the strategy I've seen other people use here is that that first number in this sequence is simply a counter. Enter and enter. So we started with a base value of two. We've doubled it once and twice and three times and as many times as we so desire. So again, this is a sequencing opportunity on the home screen without any advanced features, simply using set symbols. And that's, that moves me back to looking at, oh goodness, that's what I have on the screen right now. And the next value each time was double the now value. It isn't complicated to play this game again, if you will, because I changed the first value to one in set symbols. And then as Kathy had done, I had cursored up with the, uh, to highlight the command answer. When I did that, in the particular case I've got on the screen, when we touch enter, it copies and simultaneously pastes. When we touch enter, you can see here each output is one. Okay. And let's move on. So we're going to use the sequence mode. And I'll follow my own instructions here on the uh, device. We'll clear here. And I'm going to ask you to touch the mode key. Cursor down, if you will, to the line that starts with functions. Probably females and smart people and males, yes, would all cursor to the right. And those of us who may be a little bit Looking for an easy way to do something, maybe cursor to the left one time, but we're going to arrive at sequence and touching the enter key to select sequence. I'm also uh, wanting to point out on this screen that I'm in the math print uh, category. Okay, so let's go back, second quit, and back on a home screen. I'd like to consider these this sequence process. Second stat gives us a menu set for list information. Cursor to the right to list operations. And let's cursor down highlighting number five sequences. Now, sometimes I'll run through a menu and I won't once once I select something from the menu, I won't always know the syntax, and I'm sort of stuck, and I have to go back or, or do some thinking. Well, what's nice here is that we get a template provided for us. So let's try something here. And I'm going to try um, maybe two multiplied. I could use the X key, but how about let's do something different, alpha and the math key gives us an A, plus one. Cursor down to the variable, and this simply says, what variable did you put in your expression? Alpha A, alpha math gives us an A. And I'd like to start this sequence with one, and I'd like for my final value to be seven, I'll use a step of one. If we use step of 0 0.5, we'd have more values than one, two, three. On the other hand, if we stepped by two, we would miss some of the values between one and seven. 
cursor down to the phrase or the word paste while that's highlighted touch the enter key and our syntax has been completed for us when we touch the enter key we should be able to create a sequence that follows those commands let's try that now and notice these are all listed in set symbols we have three five seven nine eleven thirteen fifteen if we wanted every other value we could cursor up highlight the original statement while we're there we can press enter it will copy and paste if I only want every other then we'll have a step value of two and you can see the result occasionally with a list or with a sequence we may want to have a sum for those second stat would provide for us an opportunity under the math category to find many of the options you see here I'll focus just on one sum and I'll go back to the original insert even though the technology will close that parenthesis good mathematics suggests that I should and we have a sum for that for that particular sequence were we to need a cumulative sum would that have been possible second stat moving to the operations command and we can see that we have a choice for cumulative sum once again selecting the original sequence closing the parenthesis you can see we have a, we are accumulating an ongoing set of uh, a, a sums well that's good if we want to do some basic sequence work on the home screen but sometimes we maybe want to do something that is um, uh, that deals with a graph or uh, various lists and with that I'm going to suggest that we touch the Y equal key because way back we did change the mode from function to sequence in fun in the uh, sequence command I'm going to uh, go ahead and pop something on the screen and if you'll notice on the uh, handout that I have here at the top of the screen for um, for sequences we have sequence uh, in sequence in plus one and in plus two with the sequence in that I have right now I simply inserted square root of n and quite honestly there's nothing that's recursive about this I give you an X you give me a Y nice thing about this though is had I done have had I created this on a function y equals square root of x I would have gotten a continuous function but here I'm looking for this discrete function and it's a great opportunity to talk about the difference there are times that we have students activities where we uh, ask them to um, to create uh, find a function and yet the values that we uh, the situation we gave call for a discrete uh, set of values uh, the second one of these choices sequence n plus one that would require you'll notice that I have uh, use of u of n plus one equals u of n multiplied by two plus one so since it requires a u of n then you can see that there's u of n is five so we need that starter value and at the bottom of that screen u of n plus two then we will need to insert u of n and u of n plus one in some form in some uh, calculation but we'll need a value two starter values well let's try something I'm going to move past those and because of time I have another question for you And that question is in the chat are you familiar with something called the rule of 72 
And if you are familiar with the rule of 72, insert a 1. If you're not, insert a 0. And I'll ask Mike or Kathy to uh, give us some feedback. And I see some zeros, I see some ones. And I'm going to add one more piece of this to my screen, just a moment. And, and Johnny, I'd say we're kind of split-ish, leaning on the side of more people have not seen the rule of 72 than this at half. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, well, here's, here's where I'd like to go. I'm going to fast forward through these screens and pose a question. Generally speaking, an investment made at a given interest rate, P, may be doubled in 72 divided by P years. So if your interest rate is 8, 8%, then you hope for that investment to be doubled in nine years. More likely today, it's an interest rate of one, and you should expect your investment to double in only 72 years. Well, let's look at a function. And I've got one on the screen, and I'm going to type that on, um, on the uh, TI-84, and let's take a look at that. All right. I'm using n minimum zero, that's zero starting years. And I'm going to, because my interest rate is 9%, I'm multiplying by 1.09. Open parenthesis, I'll look back and do what? Multiply by u in minus one. So I should remove that parenthesis, and where in the world would we find this special looking U? And if we look above seven at the left in blue, second seven, open parenthesis, and the N comes from the X, T, theta, and N key, because we're in sequence mode, we get an N, minus one in close parenthesis. That certainly does suggest that we need a starter value. And I'll start with $100. I want to touch the window key now. Before I even look at a graph, there's some extra information in the window key. The end minimum I started with is zero. We can set the end max as we please. Now, because I think I'm going to double my money in eight years, I'll be safe and convert this to 10. Plot start, plot step uh, regarding a graph, but I'm really more interested in a list. But if I were looking at the graph, I would look at a negative 2 to 20 for my x values, or perhaps a negative 2, just so I can get the axes, uh, uh, each axis on the screen. And by a scale of 2, perhaps x minimum is negative 3, but I think I want the x max to be more than 200, so perhaps I should try something just larger. And the y scale, arbitrary, I'll just try 25. Now, that's a window setup, and there are the values that I have touching the trace key. I can see that my $100 investment after one year is $109, two years, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight years. That's pretty doggone close to doubling the investment. If we were to look at second table, then we can also see that same information. Well, that's a good, that was a good trick. But what if we go back and change the interest
interest rate to 8%. Well, I won't go back to the graph, but I will go back to the table. At 8%, when does the money double approximately? And it looks like we're getting close. Nine years. It's pretty cool. It's a rule of thumb uh, for finance. And if we go back to WIQL and we were to change the um, 1.08 to 1.12, then we would expect somewhere around 12, uh, about six years for that. Okay, I'm looking at time, and I don't want to – those features are great. Uh, I also will go back to this list, and I am going to make one reminder here. Right here we have use of u of n plus 2 equals u of n plus u of n plus 1. These three categories at the top are quite specific. So if I'm looking for n plus 2, and once I'm here, I know it's n plus 2. So I recognize I'll need a u of u of n and u of n plus 1. So just some good common sense with that. Well, because of time, I have a different question for you. Let's talk about piecewise graphing. And with that, I'm going to go back to the mode on the uh, – back to function command. And with function, I'll go back to y equal. And my goodness, I will tell you, I love this uh, piecewise function creation because in the past, I had to know all kinds of syntax. And I had to know that there were some things behind the scenes and – a lot of rationale of what the technology was doing to provide me with the good mathematics. All right, let's give this a try. This is something new to me. It's probably not new to everyone else, but I'd like to create a function here that is uh, represents piecewise graphing. And let's give this a try. So if we can, I want to go to the catalog second zero gives us a catalog. And I want to get down to the P for piecewise. And right now you notice in the upper right hand corner we see an A. So our cursor or our keys are already in alpha mode. So if we touch the eight key, that's really the P. Cursor down and cursor again and touch the inner key, we'll choose piecewise functions. And because of time here, I would like to choose uh, Left arrow, you see the flashing left or right. I'll choose the left arrow and say I want piecewise function with two pieces. Arrow down to OK and touch Enter. I'll tell you right now, if that's not worth the price of admission that you see piecewise function the way it looks like in a textbook, the way you would write it or uh, insert it on a marker board or in one of your handouts or anything you want, that looks good right there. So I have a question for you. And in my question, authentic situations, and I have a few on the screen, but we're going to choose one of those. And where I work, where I live, we have Black Mountain Utility District, and they charge two thousand, or they charge twenty-five dollars thirteen cents for the first two gallons or two thousand gallons of water that we uh, that we consume. And eight dollars and forty-four cents for each gallon after, or each thousand after that. But I've simplified those numbers right here. Now, what would that look like? What would that look like in piecewise? What would your first piece look like? I'm going to give you a chance to think about that just for a moment because we don't have a lot of time. But I think it's going to look like. This. So let's give that a try. That's a rate of $25 if you just do anything with. And that is going to be for zero gallons of waters, second math, number six would allow less than or equal to X, and second math, not cool, second math. Math number six, 
and two for 2,000 gallons. Right arrow, and I'll insert, hmm, anybody have a suggestion here? I'll give you a moment to think. I agree with you. That's $25 for the first two gallons, 2,000 gallons of water, plus, let's say, 8 multiplied by X. Yes, X. Well, X minus 2. And that would be for the number of gallons, second math, number 3, Now, the graph, I'm not sure how that graph's going to look. Let's see. Whoa. Uh, we see, and if we chose to use trace, and I'm going to save some time, touch zero, enter. Was If I don't, if I'm not even home, but I'm on the water system, it still costs me $25. And for... Hey, Johnny, I think we lost your audio. Yep, we did. I'm not sure Johnny's going to realize that or not, but uh, he's still presenting, and his audio is not connected. So uh, let's give him a minute here. It should prompt him to reconnect his audio, uh, but he's got to call back in. So uh, like I said, just give him a minute. And while we're waiting for Johnny to uh, call back in, I know a lot of you are expressing uh, questions about whether or not your 84 or your 84 plus C or 84 plus CE uh, can do some of the things that Johnny and, and uh, Kathy had done tonight? And the answer is yes. Um, if it's not doing it currently, it probably just needs to update. Um, and the current version it kind of depends on which 84 you have. Uh, again, there, there's three models available. So uh, I'm going to try and uh, sneak in at the end here where uh, you can watch a really short video on how to update. Um, and also at the end, Kathy and Johnny are also going to give their email out. Uh, so if there's any questions that maybe we missed, uh, I know they're going to be really receptive to getting those questions asked uh, over email after the webinar. So thanks, everyone, for, uh, for dealing with this, and uh, just hang tight. Michael, while everybody's waiting, I'm going to answer one question that I saw in the chat about my uh, work on the home screen with the storing capacity while ago. When, when we typed in uh, the expression with the equal sign and it gave it a 1, I talked about a 1 and a 0. That's where the calculator is using Boolean algebra, where 1 says that the statement is true and a 0 says the statement is not true. One of the things I didn't mention then, that's a really fine way for students to check to see if a value makes a statement true that's an inequality. And those um, symbols are under that second math that gives you the test, not only the equal sign there, but all the others as well. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, we are going to begin wrapping things up. Uh, I think uh, Johnny uh, completely dropped for whatever reason. So um, let me uh, share where that's available on our website as far as doing the update. If you visit our website, education.ti.com, under the Resources tab, uh, actually, let me show you two things real quick. First, under the Downloads tab, you can go to All Software, OS, and Apps. And that's where you can say, oh, I have a T84 Plus, or I have a T84 Plus C, or CE. Uh, and you can download and see what the current version is and see if yours is actually up to date. Um, and if you're wondering, well, how do I update it? It's been a long time. Uh, under the Resources tab, go down to Tutorials in the middle. And then in the middle again, Graphing Tutorials. 
And let's say you pick the T I D E three plus and T I D four plus graphing calculator families. Um, I'm just going to pick the professional learning tutorials for the 84 plus silver. And I just found this a few minutes ago. So these are all short videos, all free on using the 84 series. Uh, if you scroll down to L, right now I'm looking at D and E, going down to L. And it looks like updating the operating system on the calculator. It's a three minute, three second video. Uh, so that should help you uh, maybe refresh your memory on how to do an update. We're excited to give a little information about the T-Cube Interna International Conference coming to Dallas uh, in mid-March this coming year. That's going to be here before you know it. Registration is open on our website. Uh, if you've ever been to the conference, um, then you probably had this experience where you get to really meet like-minded educators and um, learn a little bit about technology and pedagogy and content. So uh, please feel free to visit our website to learn a little more about the T-Cube International Conference. Um, and as Kathy mentioned earlier, uh, tonight we're giving away to one lucky winner a T-Cube International Conference registration. And tonight our winner is Karen Timrak. So Karen, congratulations. We would love to see you as well as everyone else at the T-Cubed International Conference. Uh, Karen, we'll give you uh, an email, send you an email here in a couple of days and give you a little more information. To receive a certificate of attendance for tonight, uh, I'm going to post that in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents that Johnny and Kathy put together, and there's, there's a lot of them. It's worth looking through, um, and there's some extra documents that are also uh, available that uh, Johnny and Kathy want to include from another TQ instructor uh, named Karen Camp. So again, a lot of documents uh, made available to you guys for tonight. Please feel free to use those links to get the certificate and the documents for tonight. Um, and if those links aren't working for any reason, automatically you're going to get an email here in a couple of days, which will have links to the certificate, the documents, and the recording as well to go at your own pace. Um, and if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. Uh, thanks so much, Kathy and Johnny, and I wish Johnny was here to, to get thanks uh, here in person, but Kathy, thanks so much for everything for tonight. Thank you for letting me have the chance to talk to folks. And thanks to everyone for sticking around a couple extra minutes here. We hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night.